It's really too early to tell. Uh, we don't know exactly how uh, many of these transitions and wars will end, but I think we can say some things. I think that despite the fact that many people now are trying to minimize the significance of the uprisings by pointing to the absence of democratization or the failure of the transitions, I don't think historians will look at it that way. I think this will be seen as a very significant rupture in the way politics works in, in, in the Arab world and the Middle East. Uh, it might be seen as a rupture in a negative direction. It might be seen as a time when hopes for democracy ended. Um, I think that the legacies of the failed states and the civil wars, the, uh, the consequences of Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, those will be shaping the region for decades to come. And I think that the failures of some of the key transitional countries like Egypt will also haunt the region for, for decades. I think that in many ways, uh, we might end up seeing two things of profound significance. One, that there was widespread popular mobilization around key political issues that succeeded far beyond the expectations that anybody had. But then secondly, that the, the resistance to those changes by regional elites uh, and, and by, the, by states proved to be sufficient to turn what could have been a positive into something profoundly negative. There's nothing inevitable about that. And I think historians will go back and I hopefully, I think they'll be able to pinpoint the reasons why things went the way they did and be able to recover the possibilities that were there. So the decline of U.S. influence is an interesting thing because on the one hand, people often compare uh, where the United States is now to where it was in the 1990s, which was really a genuinely unique historical moment. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, after the Gulf War, this was a time when the U.S. was in a position of basically unchallenged primacy. But that's a very unusual historical period, and it's not usually like that. What we're seeing now, I think, is a return to a more natural type of international order with uh, uh, much higher levels of competition, and uh, one in which the United States is still an extremely powerful player, but it doesn't have unquestioned primacy. I think what it means for the Middle East is that the regional order that the U.S. had, had shaped uh, and sought to protect is fading from the scene. Uh, and I think that that's something which you can observe everywhere from, uh, from, uh, from the Levant through the Gulf. From the point of view of, the, of, of Arab states and of Arab regimes, I see very little sign that any of them want to abandon the United States, but they're hedging. Uh, they're, they're concerned about U.S. commitments. They're concerned about U.S. willingness and ability to act militarily. And so like any good, normal, great or power, normal states, they're looking for options uh, just in case the U.S. security guarantee goes away. When, when I look at the future of the, of the U.S. position in the Middle East, I actually see things a bit differently. A lot of people look to Russia as supplanting the United States as a leading player. I think that's wrong. I think that Russia is still a relatively marginal player in the Middle East, and it will be for, for the future. It's a declining power, it has relatively limited assets, and uh, it, it can do some damage, but it's not in a position to be a, 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 a hegemon in the Middle East. I think China, on the other hand, is a, is a player that has really profound interests in the Middle East and has every reason to want to move in to protect energy supplies in the Gulf and to be able to protect, again, to hedge against a withdrawal of U.S. power. So when I think of the consequences of the U.S. decline, I think that one of them is likely to be that China will be forced to, uh, to shift its policy of basically free riding on U.S. power, and it'll probably have to move into the region in a much more significant way. So the Middle East in the next decade is likely to continue to see the unfolding of these, uh, of the repercussions of the uprisings. I think 
There's no state in the Middle East that I would say is more stable or more secure right now than it was 10 years ago. Um, in fact, I would say that uh, most of the major countries in the region uh, are more unstable now than they were in December 2010. Uh, whether you're talking about Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, certainly the states like Syria and Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, even Israel, uh, Turkey, almost every one of the states in the Middle East is facing profound economic problems, political problems, so social and cultural problems. So people who think that we've gotten past the Arab Spring and now we're in this new period of authoritarian stability, I think they're almost certainly wrong. Um, that does not mean that I think we're, we're heading for a wave of democratization. I think that the, the failure of the Arab uprisings has probably mortally damaged the hopes of peaceful democratic transitions. So I think the most likely uh, course for the next 10 years is a series of disruptions, um, uprisings, often violent, and um, a lot of instability uh, across the entire region. And I think that the combination of a great power transition with the continuing decline of the United States and the rise of China, the instability of almost every uh, country, every regime in the region, and then this enormous mass of young, extremely angry and frustrated uh, youth just makes for a situation where the only prediction is really unpredictability. Mm -hmm.